fun. Alice, how are you? Good, how are you? Thank you for joining. I'm excited. Awesome. Lanny and Jenny, so good to see everyone. How are you? Good, good. Vinny, just so you know, Alice Roker is one of our councilwomen and Lanny Gilbert is a former supervisor. So you have some town officials on this Zoom, which is super exciting. Hi, Renee. Hi. Hi, Thanks everyone. Good morning. Hi. And Jenny, too. Awesome. <laughs> All the movers and shakers of the town. Exactly. <laughs> now we just want to get smarter. <laughs> so we'll give everybody a few more minutes before we kick it off. Hi, Marty. How would I know the exact amount? If, well, they never send me a bill is my problem. Uh-oh. Got it. Multitasking. <laughs> I'm glad Wendy sent me that link. Wendy's awesome. Yeah, I had gone into the other, you know, just hit putting in the numbers and I was just sitting there. <laughs> Jenna, welcome. Hi, glad to be you. here. Good to see you. Thanks for joining. We're giving people a few more minutes to come in from the waiting room. Thanks for joining tonight. Oh, wow. We've got more. We got more names here. I got to click away. Look at this. Nice. And the job to and Lauren. He's at the public input session for the county police reform task force. And he'll try to come on after that. Okay, great. Well, um, Rachel, are you good if I, if I kick it off? It's, it's four after, and I know that we're going to start with, um, Vinny's going to do a presentation, but I just want to do a short intro. Do you think we should begin or? Go for it, Trish. Okay. Um, we have a special guest joining us tonight, and we are so grateful to Yorktown for Justice for kicking yeah. this event off. Um, Vinnie Bagwell is a native of Westchester County and has most recently created the seven foot bronze sculpture of abolitionist and suffragist Sojourn Truth at the Welcome Center over the Hudson State Historic Park at Poughkeepsie. As of February 17th, she is one of the finalists in Newark, New Jersey, where, she, where the city is commissioning a new statue to honor Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad of New Jersey. Um, there's a lot more that I can say about her and her work, but I rather just jump in. She's going to talk for about 30 minutes and give a presentation. And then, um, Allison and myself have a few questions and we hope we can take some of your questions. She's a huge body of work and I invite you all to really, um, in, look her up, but let's jump right in and welcome Vinny and have her kick it off with her presentation. Hey, hi there. How are you? I'm going to go into share and I'm going to open up. All right, so um, Vinnie Bagwell, I am making history. All right, so let's see if we can get this to be friendly. Hi, I am a storyteller. I'm going to whip through this relatively fast because I want to open it up for discussion. So I'm a storyteller and when I was growing up in the 60s, um, I grew up during the period where the civil rights movement had begun and black people were hopeful, you know, because we were trying to gain equality. And so in that process, um, let's see how this is working. Hold on one second. This is not, bear with me. Let me just get this down to, Maybe 105, I say, cause you can't see everything. All right, so it was a high time for the civil rights movement. And by the way, this is all my artwork. So I'm just talking yeah. as I'm going through. So I grew up 
like a lot of people in the 60s going to church every Sunday. Um, my mother was pretty good about it. We didn't have to go to uh, Bible study or Sunday school, but we definitely went to church every Sunday. And the interesting thing is that in those days, I mean, I'm not sure how it is now, but in those days, um, the black church was very instrumental in uh, just daily life for black people. They were helpful in helping people get um, affordable housing, helping people get jobs. <clears throat> they were always involved with, you know, civil rights adventures and things like that. So ironically, uh, when I was seven, Martin Luther King came to Messiah Baptist Church in Yonkers. Oh, and um, I vividly recall waiting for him. He was late. And, um, and when he came, he was not interested in talking to the adults. He wanted to talk to the children. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they gathered all the kids together and he just spent the better part of the early uh, evening just talking to us. I mean, like one by one by one by one. And it was, for me, it was really interesting because um, I had seen him on TV. I knew who he was. And I thought it was really cool that I was meeting somebody who was on TV. And so, uh, of course, you know, as I was growing up, I saw the rise of black power. I recall asking my mother permission to wear an Afro because uh, Afros are not just wash and go and some people think it's not low maintenance. And so uh, it was a very interesting time because again, there was all this consciousness raising. Um, my mother was very, very um, aware in that she had me reading early. So for instance, I read Malcolm X's autobiography when I was 10. Um, there was a bunch of stuff that she had me reading, you know, summer reading. I was reading these things about, you know, black pride, black everything. And so um, my mother also too was into music. So, you know, I grew up listening to jazz and of course R&B. This is Marvin Gaye down in the DC um, area. They have a new recreation center named after him. Yeah. And so the interesting thing um, about my growing up is that uh, in the 60s, Black people weren't in the magazines. You did not see them in anything other than our magazines. So Ebony Essence and Jet informed me about Black aesthetics. That's how I knew that Black was beautiful. So these are my illustrations from middle school and high school. Wow. I was obviously, I mean, from the very beginning when they let me have a pencil, clearly um, gifted. And by the time I got to kindergarten, I was reading and already knew how to write the alphabet. I used to argue with my teacher because I wanted to write script. I didn't want to write plain. And so um, the interesting thing about, I guess, my education is, of course, I start off grade one through four uh, in a visually handicapped class in Yonkers. And then grades five through 12, um, we moved to Greenberg Central 7. And Ultimately, I went to a black college, I went to Morgan. And of course, in those days, um, they were very serious about black excellence. If somebody didn't do their homework, we had to get a lecture about how mediocrity was not okay, how you had to work harder because you're black and how black excellence was a real goal. And of course, because it was hammered into me for four years, you know, I took that as the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, during this time, I had a lot of mentors. Um, in high school, when I got to eighth grade, because back then they let the eighth graders be with the 12th graders. Um, when I got to eighth grade, the English chair um, picked up on me and decided that she wanted to be my mentor. And so she pulled me aside because she looked at my grades and whatnot. It's like, oh, you're an overachiever. Okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take two English classes every semester. So every semester for four years, I took what they, what they then called regents, Diploma English, which is the advanced English. And then I took extracurricular English. So there was critical writing, um, creative writing. There was um, persuasive writing. I mean, there was all these different extracurricular writing classes. So by the time I got to college, I was a writing athlete, which made college very easy. And then ultimately, um, of course I had a mentor in college was my department chair. I was a, a psychology major. When I got out of college, I had changed my mind. Senior year in college, my mentor was like, I don't care what you do, but you owe your parents a degree, you gotta get out of here. I'm getting you out of here. So when I got back to New York, I went to school in Maryland, um, I looked for another mentor. This is Harold E. Sanson, he was in Elmsford. And Harold is the person who taught me graphic design. He also is the person who taught me how to be self-employed. And so back then he was like, you know, your biggest problem is that you're an artist and you're too smart to work a regular job. There's as much money in the street as there is in some corporate job, want to just work in the street. 
And of course, I had grown up with parents and friends and family who had like serious jobs. These people worked Monday to Friday, got a check every Friday, you know, and, and, and were able to buy houses and things like that. But none of these people were self-employed. So being self-employed was a novel idea. And I was like, yeah, I want to do that because I didn't like working for other people because it seemed like everybody I worked for was stupid. At any rate, the real magic began in 1993. This is my first sculpture ever. And how I came to be sculpting was that I realized one day that I hadn't painted in seven years. And seven years is a long time, but it's a really long time when you're in your 30s. And so I was trying to figure out how to get back to painting. And I decided to try sculpting as a way to prime the well. Well, after I made this, I was like, oh, this is so easy. I love this. And of course, the big question is, how do I do this? The big challenge was that we didn't have internet. Well, fast forward. The gift ended up making me what I now refer to as a creative steward of our nation's memory. And essentially what that means is that very early on, it became apparent to me that black people weren't in the public realm and public art. I'm looking around, I don't see anything about black people. I'm seeing a lot of dead presidents. I'm seeing a lot of war heroes. I'm seeing stuff that has nothing to do with black people, but I'm not seeing black people. And so this is when I decided that I wanted to create public art that conveys unvarnished truth. This is Frederick Douglass at Hofstra. And so the idea was to share the history of people of color because we had been marginalized. Now, when I say marginalized, I mean, when you have a whole group of people that are not allowed to participate in, I'll just say the public's realm, you're marginalizing them. And, and I've got a lot of people take this for granted. Sometimes black people take it for granted. There's a lot of things that we have not been allowed to do. Ironically, public art is one of them. In the United States, let's just talk about, train gun guy. Let's just talk about public art about, yeah. let's talk about public art about people, like representational figurative art. You've got something like 5,600 public artworks in the United States that are about people. Less than 5% of them are made by women. Less than that are about and made by Black people. That's what we're talking about. And so my style is anchored in realism. If you went to art school, you call it naturalism. I didn't go to art school. I'm untutored. This is Ella Fitzgerald at the Yonkers Metro North train station. In 1995, um, I was writing for Gannett. I was a newspaper columnist by that time. And I really wanted to meet other artists, but I didn't know how. I really wanted to meet people who were sculpting. I didn't know how. Coincidentally, I ran into a group of people. They happened to be academics, you know, working for a school of visual arts, whatever the case may be. And they wanted to create art for public places in the downtown waterfront. This is when Yonkers was blighted in the, in the mid nineties. And so of course they were interested in me because I worked for Gannett. I was interested in them because they were from my planet. So the first year that we were together, I was the person who wrote the 501c3 and I became the grant writer, got them a chunk of change to do the first projects. And of course they thought my ideas were too big. So they just kind of ostracized me and my ideas for the first year. So when the second cycle of grants come around, they were busy executing the first uh, uh, grant funding. And I was like, that's okay, because I'm gonna write my own proposal. So I did for Ella Fitzgerald. City of Yonkers said, yes. The problem was that the city of Yonkers only gave me a third of the money. And of course, in those days I used to cry a lot because I really, really, really wanted to do this. I didn't know what I was doing. So the foundry, Sculpture House Casting, um, they became like my family and city said, don't worry about it. And when they said, don't worry about it, what they meant was that they were gonna give the casting to their cousin in Frenchtown, Pennsylvania. So all the little bit of money that I gave them, they gave to their cousin. They didn't make any money on this job. Their idea was we're gonna invest in you because we think if we give you one, you will get two. And that's when we start to get paid. Of course, now I'm open there and it's five every year and we high five all the time. But you know, it's, it's an interesting kind of thing because what people don't understand today, and I had a two hour conversation with Time Magazine and the New York Times last year this time, trying to explain to these young girls who are writing for the papers and the magazine and whatnot, that you know, they wanna know, well, how are we gonna get women and, and people of color in the public art uh, arena? It's like, you don't, because it's a white patriarch arena 
And it's designed that way. It's been that way for thousands of years. And if you don't have an invitation to get into the public art realm, your chances to get in are very, very small. Fortunately for me, I was invited in. So now when you go looking for black sculptors, you don't see very many of them. And if you're looking for a black woman, hi, it's me. Not to say I'm the only one, I'm just simply saying people who are winning all the time, year after year, I have a record now. So my work is defined by candid portraiture. Somebody asked me, what does that mean? It's like, it's not a grip and grin. You know how when you go to the, to the photographer studio and you stand there real prim like this and you just get real stiff, it's like, no, that's, well, what we call gripping grins. Candid portraiture is when somebody just takes a picture of you just being you, talking, doing whatever you're doing, and that's how they capture you. I like to do that because as far as I'm concerned, that's more human. People don't stand around like statues. People move, they talk, they do stuff. By the way, this is Walter Doc Hurley. Uh, he's in Hartford, Connecticut. Turned out to be the first sculptor of a contemporary African-American in the state of Connecticut. I put it up in 2019, the state of Connecticut. Again, stunning. It is. My work elevates the culture of marginalized people. This is in Memphis, Tennessee. And I gotta tell you, modeling and carving sculpture is what I call my occupation. There is nothing else I would rather do. And luckily for me, there's a lot of things that I can do, but this is what I want to do. So in many instances, particularly now, um, needless to say, I compete for public art, but I also sometimes create my own public art commissions. I get great ideas and it's like, I'm just gonna raise the money for that because I'm a grant writer. And of course, since I know what the vision is, it's easy for me to write the applications and to do things like that. Usually public art commissions are established by a municipality, a nonprofit, whatever the case may be. Then they do a public call for artists and then they have everybody, you know, send their qualifications and they, they pick five finalists and then they pick the winner. The other way around, people agree that, yeah, we want you to do it. And then I just do it. So the goal is to cast in bronze. You know, when I first began, the big question is how do you afford that? Because bronze is quite expensive. And again, this is how I came to be doing public art because public art is designed to give you big chunks of change to hold and sustain you for a year while you make the artwork. So that is kind of what drives you know, my focus on public art. And so um, practical sensibility, of course, led me to try uh, bronze resin, bronze resin, bonded bronze, whatever you want to call it, um, is a kind of plastic, actually. The beauty of it is that it looks like bronze. So oftentimes when I'm competing, if I want to really show somebody what I want to make, I cast. This is Harriet Tubman and Thomas Garrett, which I created for Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, somebody else won, but it was one of those instances where I met my soul brother. Our artworks look so similar, it's just that his was much more kinetic than mine. When I finally saw what he made, I wasn't mad anymore. I'm like, okay, fine, you win. Bar relief techniques. Um, again, in the beginning, I was trying to figure out what my limitations are. I don't have very many, which is nice. And so then at some point, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to create like my own signature style. Like when you see a sculpture, you know it's mine. And so I decided to put bar relief sculptures on the surfaces of my sculptures. So this is the back of Teddy Roosevelt, which is at the Roosevelt Senior High School in DC. In 2012, um, this goes back to the image that I showed at the very beginning, uh, Ruben Santiago Hudson, this is the guy who also directed Ma Rainey, I don't know if you all saw that on Netflix. But back then he was doing the piano lesson at the Signature Theater, which is technically on Broadway. And he wanted someone to create the piano for this play. And when he asked around, I was on everybody's bucket list. So he decided to check me out first. And when he saw my work, he's like, that's who I'm looking for. So we had a little chat about what the play was about. And this is the artwork that I created for the piano. Um, the good thing is that at the beginning, I had the foresight to ask him, what are you gonna do with that piano when you're finished? And of course the theater, they don't keep the props and things like that. So he says, well, oftentimes we give it to the actors or you know, sometimes we sell stuff, but we can't keep stuff. So I said, well, can I have the piano? He's like, you got room for a piano? I said, oh yeah, I'm gonna make some room for a piano. I have room for a piano, yes. <laughs> and by the way, I am Willie Boy. 
Willie Boy is the invisible character in the play who made the piano. You never see the maker of the okay. piano, you hear about him. That would be me, that's me. So they gave me the piano. Wow. So in this instance, you see, again, the beauty of bar relief is that I can expand my storytelling to inform the viewer, to make them understand you know, what the story is about, and it also creates visual intrigue. It is easy for me to snatch your eye. I can make you look. The real question is how long can I make you look? And so the details matter. This is the paper in Frederick Douglass's hand. And again, it's perfectly legible. You know, if I'm gonna write, I want you to be able to read it. Mm -hmm. And so my subjects have souls and they speak to the viewer. I discovered this when social media came about. I was probably one of the last people to get on Facebook because I just didn't understand it and didn't care and I was old and stuff. And so finally, when I understood what I could do with it, I was like, okay, I can make my own little show on Facebook. This is cool. What was really fascinating for me in the beginning is how people from all over the world wanted to talk about the artwork. People who don't speak English, people who aren't from America. I'm talking about people from Japan where they got the, 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 the symbols. You don't even know what it says. It's not even in a, like an alphabet. They wanna talk. Now you gotta, okay, copy, cut, paste, translate, <laughs> and answer, copy, translate, paste. And this will go on for like a half hour. People just kind of, you know, talking about the artwork and what they thought. And that's when I realized that art is a universal language. It doesn't matter that you're from the other side of the world. Interestingly enough, people outside this country don't look at this as black art. They look at it as art about the culture in America. And it happens to be specifically about people of color. That's the difference between this country and other places. I learned that on Facebook. And so the idea is that, you know, the artwork is meant to be engaging. This is Clayton LaBeouf. You may recognize him from The Wire. His daughters live around the corner from me. And so they sent me this picture and I think it's really cool because I love her red hair and I think it's a really cool shot. So when my daughter was five, she wanted to ask me, is there any such thing as black princesses? My daughter's five. And I'm thinking you're five and you peep Disney already because when she was five in 1995, there were no black princesses at all, period. Pocahontas was the closest thing and she's not black, okay? The point of it is, and the irony of it is my father's family is from Pocahontas trial for, tried, for real. Accomack, Virginia, those are the Pohatna Indians, that's my family. At any rate, point of it is, is that I was like, yes, there is a such thing as black princesses. And she wanted to ask me, well, why aren't they on TV? Said, they're not on TV. And then I had to leave the room because I don't want to have to explain to my five-year-old about racism. So I was like, yeah, okay, I see how it is. So I made black princesses, black angels, black mermaids, black fairies, because my feeling was that black children should be able to dream just like everybody else's child, okay? You can be a fairy if you want to be. You can, be a, you can be a ballerina, you can be whatever you want to be. It doesn't matter what color you are. And so this is the interesting thing about being black when you have little kids and you've got to explain to them how America is. At any rate, I decided to foster what I call student enrichment experiences. And I started doing it from the very beginning. So I went to Yonkers Arts Magnet, which was Roosevelt High School at that time. And I said, give me five kids. Show me their illustrations. If they can draw as well as I could at their age, I'll take them. So I had five. Of course, four out of the five flaked out. And I let them. I'm like, look, if you don't want to do this, don't do this. You're not doing me no favors. Mm -hmm. The boy right there, him, an amazing illustrator, Jordanian, hung out me to the end. I'll never forget. I'm driving down Palisade Avenue. This is later, top down. I had a little convertible beetle bug. He and his friend's going to chase, tailgate me, chase me down for me. I'm like, what? Who is that? Miss Bagwell, what's up? I'm like, hi, what you doing? Miss Bagwell, look at my slides. I'm standing in the middle of Palisade Avenue like this, looking at slides. He's got better slides than me. And I said to him, if you never see me again, listen, that's what I want you to remember. Don't forget your artwork. It'll save your sanity. So lo and behold, for real though, 25 years later, social media, guess what he does? <laughs> He's a filmmaker. I love it. Oh, okay. That was the coolest thing, I swear. I don't know what the others are doing, but that's what he's doing. And so I allow people to come into my studio. I swear to God, I purge my house and let strange people come in. I don't mind little kids. 
In 2004, I became a finalist for the Northwest corner of Central Park. This is the presentation that I made. Um, Bryce Turner is an architect out of Baltimore. This man builds cities in Dubai, Siberia. He does not do public art, but because he's a friend of a friend, he agreed to work with me. And of course the joy is that he comes up with the most remarkable ideas. So I didn't win. Frederick Douglass was bought by Hofstra. It was also bought by the Frederick Douglass Museum in Maryland. If you're not familiar, in Highland Beach, Maryland, which is in Anne Arundel County over by Annapolis, mm -hmm. um, there was a time when the land there belonged to white people and black people weren't allowed to go to the beach, for real. When the man that owned the land died, he willed the land to his wife. When she died, she put a note in her will that said the land could only be sold to black people. And that's how Highland became a black town, no lie. So Frederick Douglass's son bought this corner lot to build his father a summer house. And the goal was, because it's right on the water, the goal was for his father to be able to sit on the porch and look across the bay at Talbot County where he was enslaved as a free man. Unfortunately, Frederick Douglass died, had a heart attack, died and didn't get to live in the house. They turned it into a museum. So they bought the sculpture and now they're talking about putting life-size Frederick Douglass, his son and his daughter Laura on the front lawn. They're raising their money, stay tuned on that. All right, so in 2010, I created an initiative to celebrate enslaved Africans in Yonkers. Now, I live around the corner from the Phillips Manor Hall. Somehow I forgot that the Phillips family were slave traders. Yeah, Pardon me, I got an elderly chihuahua I gotta help. If I don't, she's gonna jump off and break a leg and I can't afford it, hold on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So Patricia McDowell at the time was the majority leader for the city of Yonkers. I didn't know her. And she announces that she wants to create a monument to the slaves. I'm like, okay, you have any money? No. Do you know where to find any money? Yes. How much? $20,000. I'm like, Fine, I'll take you 20, let's start with that. So point of it is, is that I went to my landlord who kept telling people about me because I was living in 92 men and sitting on the ninth floor deck like I owned it. And whenever people would come to see the building like, and this is Vinnie Bagwell and she did Ella Fitzgerald and you know, Vinnie, we should do something together. So lo and behold, I went back to him and said, can I get a year's worth of free rent? He's like, Vinnie, we're not that rich. <laughs> <laughs> and so, he says, I got partners. Well, ask your partners. Ask them what can you do? For real, ask them. So they came back and they gave me five months of free rent. My rent was $2,800 a month. It's $11,400. I'm like, I will take your money. He said, no, we understand it. You need money to develop. I'm like, yes. I don't want to have to work at Nordstrom and be trying to think on the way to work or during my lunch hour or 11 o'clock at night when I'm tired after standing for 12 hours. So I went to the city of Yonkers and I said to them, if I find $50,000, would you match me so I can show you an idea for what I have that I want to do for the enslaved Africans? Because do you know that there are no monuments to the enslaved Africans? I mean, not the icons, not Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and Sir Jim Tooth, the rest of the people. So mm -hmm. luckily, in those days was Phil M. McConey. He was like, yeah. And so I said, okay. So I came back. I got my 50. Where's your 50? They said, we got 50. So we created this That's beautiful. exhibition, which traveled. I went to Janet Langsam, who is the CEO for Arts Westchester, which is the Arts Council in Westchester County. And I said, Janet, I need, I need a godmother. I need you to help me. I don't need your money. I'm gonna bring you the money. I need you to be a, a fiscal advisor. I need your resources. I need your Rolodex. And Janet said, yes. I'm like, okay. And so we began to rock and roll. This was the first exhibition that was held at Arts Westchester. Hey, be nice, stop that. And so the idea was to emphasize the importance of preserving local history. This is the Phillips Manor Hall. Phillips Manor Hall is the oldest standing building in Westchester County. It's almost 400 years old now. The point of it is, is that most people don't know that the Phillips family was the largest slave trader yeah. in the country, second to the people in South Carolina. These people slave traded for 10 years. And we're talking about way before the iconic ones in, in the South. We're talking about 18, 18, excuse me, 1685. Yeah. 
1695. Later, much later, when the Europeans finally decided to come, because nobody was here, because believe it or not, America was black once upon a time. For every five people, four of them were black. No kidding. The point of it is, is that when the Europeans finally decided to come, that's when they started changing the laws about slavery, because originally they were supposed to be indentured servants. As they realized how much needed to be done and they got all into their economic development you know, goals and things like that, that's when they started changing the law to continue to oppress these people and keep them enslaved. All right, fine. So Pat and I had a chat and I was like, okay, let's do five people because you got to show the breadth of slavery. It's an epic story. So you need to talk about women, men, elderly people, children. I mean, nobody was exempt. So this is Isati. She's the first sculptor. She was funded by New York State Council on the Arts. This is Bibi. Bibi is the elder woman and she was funded by the city of Yonkers. And again, the idea is to humanize the memory of these people because it is easy to think of people as other when they don't look like you. An example would be, oh, how about the Mexicans when we decided to deport them and put their children in cages and separate them from their, from their families? How about that? That was very easy to do because you made them be other. Yeah. Totally dehumanized them. Black people sitting there like, well, welcome to our world. At any rate, the point of it is, is that that's not how people are supposed to be. So Ty Grayell is the poet laureate for District of Columbia, we became Facebook friends. And one day he called me up and he started telling me stories. And I said, we got to work together. I, you know what? I want you to write five stories for my sculptures and I want you to humanize them. Tell me who they are. I'm naming them. They all have names. And I make people call them by their name, like they're a person. You can't call them. I mean, we do refer to the children as the children, but usually it's BB, Isati, Thumba the Boatman. Again, you humanize them. Tell me who they were. Who were they before they got captured? Mm -hmm. Tell me about the trip. How is it like being on a boat, in the belly of a boat for three months? Tell me what happened when they got here. Make me know these people. When I do workshops with the fifth graders, they freak out when I turn the, turn the audio off because it, the stories are like 10 minutes long and I don't have that much time because usually they're in for a half an hour you know, at a pop. And I'm like, well, you know, go to YouTube. You can watch it later. They like, well, no, what happened? They want to, because they get totally stuck in the story. That is a good sign. So we would do these artist talks and I would bring Ty Grail in, take Ty Grail in to do the reading of these stories because again, trying to humanize these people. And so I started doing in-studio workshops. Entergy uh, funded me to do the workshops. And uh, at some point, somebody asked me to do fifth graders. And I'm like, what is that, 10, 11? Okay, these are my favorites, okay? What I like about the little kids is they're not affected yet. Like when you talk to the older kids, they're all like, they don't wanna look stupid in front of their friends, they won't talk. The little kids wanna talk. So we talk about the voices in our heads. We talk about our occupations, what we wanna be when we grow up. We talk about how we get in trouble because we listen to the wrong voices in our heads. I mean, we talk about all <laughs> kinds of stuff that nobody else wants to talk about. And, and when they realize that we're going to talk about it, sometimes they're like, we're going to talk about that? I'm like, yeah, we're talking about that. Let's name them. Okay, you know, I'm going to introduce mine first. You're meeting the artist. The artist's favorite person is Happy Girl. I am never unhappy when I'm making artwork. Let's talk about the skeptic and the critic. They're a tag team. The skeptic says, oh, I don't know if this is going to be a good artist talk. The, the, the critic says, you're probably going to mess it up. If you listen to the negative voices in your head, you're going to have negative ideas, negative feelings, and you're going to do negative things. Try to listen to the ones that are positive. Try to tell the difference. So we have these long conversations about the voices in your head. And most of them say, you never talk about this. I'm like, I know. You only talk about this if you're an artist. All right, so these are my students from Sarah Lawrence College. They were kind of interesting because if you're not familiar with Sarah Lawrence College, they'd give degrees, but they don't have majors. They have a very organic way about going through college, which I found fascinating. So of course I was right up their alley. And then ultimately, you know, I wanted to invite people into the studio to see art while it was being made. And so Ultimately, I started giving these serious parties. I'm talking about a couple of hundred people coming through my house. And the idea was for them to be able to come into an artist studio, look at the artwork in my home, which is also where I, I live and work in the same place. Look at the artwork before it gets cast, give me their opinions. Of course, tell me I'm a genius and all kinds of stuff like that. 
ultimately, people decide they want to support me. So for instance, this particular party was sponsored by the Human Rights Commission. <clears throat> My point simply is, is that they were very well attended. Again, black people, white people, all kinds of people, old people, young people. And you know, people were really, really thrilled to be able to come into an artist space and see a public artwork being made because most people don't get to do that. In kind services, next thing I know, people wanna give me stuff, which is nice. I needed a website. Michael Pilaw came to me and said, I wanna to talk to you about your web presence. I'm like, I don't have no money for that. He's like, I, I don't really need the money. What I want is to be able to do this for you because a couple of thousand people are gonna see your website and if they like it, they'll come looking for me. And of course that did work out for him. Elizabeth Seton University out of East Orange, New Jersey got wind of this project and they decided that they want to challenge their master's degree students to write me a marketing plan, which was really quite remarkable. These girls were quite smart and they gave me stuff to do. They analyzed how I was doing my projects and then gave me tasks to do to help increase my exposure. And they were really very helpful. That was worth a million dollars. This is Janet. Again, Janet was a fiscal administrator because most people don't understand that you can't get money as an individual. You have to be a nonprofit 501c3. Well, the Arts Council, which is an advocate for the arts, I'm like, you're the perfect godmother. I mean, you've got a $4 million a year budget. People in New York know you. And when you ask for money, you don't have to explain who you are. They already know who you are. All they wanna know is what kind of project are you doing now? And so she was marvelous. And needless to say, she gave me a prize, uh, which I'm collecting on April 7th, which is very nice because again, at the beginning, she was just like, you know, there aren't a lot of people in Westchester that work like you do. And I'm like, I know. She said, no, this is what makes you unusual because you seriously work for the arts. I'm like, no, I mean it like that. At any rate, spring 21, the enslaved Africans rain garden is coming to the world. Um, we are going to have a temporary installation of the next three, because right now there are two sculptures in the Yonkers Riverfront Library. The other three are coming right now. They're at the installer. We're getting ready to prep them for a temporary installation so people can see them before they go into the ground. And again, the idea is to engage the community. It is important to me that people have an opportunity to understand the value of art in public places. So I just keep trying to come up with ideas to introduce people to the concept because public art is one of the most, well, it's one of the most practical ways to talk about things that don't cost as much money. It's not nearly as expensive as a movie. It's not nearly as laborious as writing a book, you know, and, and it lasts for a couple of hundred years in the public space. You roll up in the, in the rain garden, you can learn about the history of slavery in, 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 in New York and Yonkers in about mm, 10 to 30 minutes. Who cares if they don't put in the curriculum? Take the kids and do on-site learning. This is the goal. Again, this is designed for the rain garden. It's going to be installed just south of the Yonkers Pier. So it's five minute walk from the Metro North train station. You guys are on, well, the river line. So just get on the train, come on down. The goal is to design truly memorable places where inspiration and innovation converge. This is the original design for the rain garden in dramatic and exciting ways. So this, by the way, is night lighting for victory. If you are not familiar, um, in 2019, I won a million dollar commission to replace the J. Marion Sims public artwork on mm -hmm. Fifth Avenue just outside Central Park at 103. For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, J. Marion Sims is the father of gynecology. For you ladies, when you know how you go get your annual pap smear and they put that speculum up your JJ, that guy, okay? Point of it is <laughs> that he experimented on black women, enslaved black women mm -hmm. with no anesthesia and no painkiller. Ladies, I don't have to say no more. You know what that must be like. Mm -hmm. The point of it is, is that after he perfected his practice, he takes it to Europe and practices on white women and uses painkillers yeah. and anesthesia. And when the communities of Harlem, East Harlem figured that out, they're like, take that down, take it down now. 
now turned into 10 years. They had to fight for 10 years to get the city of New York to remove the sculpture. So lo and behold, they put out a call for art. The selection committee picked somebody else and the community rioted. They're like, that is not what we want. You held us hostage for seven hours. For seven hours, we told you we wanted Miss Bagwell. We told you why we didn't want that person. We told you why we didn't want that. Person. And now we're going to have to ask until you do something about it. So they rioted for more than an hour. I'm talking about they did everything from screaming and crying and cursing and carrying <laughs> on. They did everything but throw furniture. If you want to see it, you can go to my YouTube page and just look for victory and look for the community response. That first 12 minutes, you're going to wonder, what in the world is this? That's because the person who was doing the video was trying to do it on the low. And when he realized that other people were videotaping, then he zoomed in and you can watch people carry on. It was unprecedented because four days later, city council, who was also pissed, stood on the front of the steps of City Hall in New York City and called out the city of New York on two counts, abuse of power and bias. Needless to say, the media had a field day saying, what about New York City? Are you kidding me? And everybody went, who is Vinnie Bagwell? Wait a minute, where's she come from and who is she? Oh, wait, you know what? She got some decent artwork. And so needless to say, everybody started parading through here trying to find out how did that happen? So, hi, this is Daylight. The goal was to change the perception of place. Mm -hmm. This is the actual design. Mm -hmm. Again, this is classic Vinnie Bagwell. Mm -hmm. The idea was, we're talking about racial democracy replacing offensive public artworks. There are, for real, more than 1,900 public artworks about the Confederacy and other kinds of offensive things. 1,900 things need to come down. The question always is when they call me, what should go up? I say it should be, in my opinion, about local history. Now, if you wanna do Martin Luther King, okay, fine. If you want to do Frederick Douglass, that's fine. But there's a dozen sculptures of Frederick Douglass in this country. Why not do somebody who's local? Like I heard you say that Harriet Tubman came through Yorktown. Well, then you got a reason to do Harriet Tubman. It's not just because she's an icon. She actually came through your town. Mm -hmm. So this is, again, victory all sides around. And again, it's an unfolding story. You've got bar relief sculpture. And basically, I'm talking about the sisterhood. Women bind together when they go through stuff. You let something happen to you. Tell me you don't call your sister, your girlfriend, your cousin, your mom, your aunt. You call somebody. And usually women cry to each other and women get together and we move the world, okay? Yep. So 2020, it's the year of the woman and it changed the narrative in public art for more reasons than one. On day two of pandemic, my governor, Andrew Cuomo, his office called and asked me, are you willing to work? I'm like, yes, I am. They said, the governor wants to make you an essential business because he wants all his public artworks to come out in time, on time. So he's concerned about you. If you're willing to work, we're gonna get you a bus essential business status. Give us a couple of days. And lo and behold, three days later, me and everybody who works with me for me was back to work. These people are like, thank you, Vinny, okay? So the cool thing about this is that, and you never know who's watching you, so Jonna Chu's been watching me, her family's been watching me for years. Her whole family's littered with artists. There's an 85 year old sixth generation grandson who turned on one of the other younger ones and said, check this chick out. And he calls me up and says, I wanna come over. I'm like, well, where are you coming from? Grand Rapids, Michigan. Okay, so when do you wanna come? Saturday, this Saturday? Yeah, you're, you're already in New York? No, you already got tickets? No, you don't wanna wait? No. So you're just gonna come, yes. I'm like, okay, that is Sojourner Truce, fifth generation grandson. Who even knew that there was any family for these people? You never think about these people having family. You just think that they're just kind of like isolated people, right? No, he's hanging out in my house. So cool. we're, we're best buddies now. This guy slept on my floor on an air mattress at the foot of Harriet Tubman. I'm on my way upstairs to bed. I said, wait, give me your phone. Let me make a picture for you. I'm not even gonna post this on Facebook. This is for you. When you get older and you have kids, you can tell people, I slept at the artist's house at the foot of the sculpture when it's being made. That's a cool thing to be able to say. Absolutely. Needless to say, we had a party. 
And again, the idea is to enable the community to see an artwork while it's being made, to talk about what it means, why it's important, you know, for me to tell them what my psychology is and all that kind of stuff. And again, people really appreciate having the opportunity because they're understanding that for Black people, it's a big deal. White people have been doing this stuff for centuries. Black people are only just starting to get representation. We don't get to see ourselves in the public realm as representational figurative artists. While white people take that for granted, we don't. So, Sojourner Truth now dignifies the walking over the Hudson. She's on the Highland side. The Poughkeepsie side is the other side. And so there's a welcome center and that's where she is. What's really cool is how people send me pictures of themselves <laughs> engaging her, you know, and, and the people that work at the welcome center are like, you no, know, people are here every day congregating, talking to each other, you know, reading, you know, the narrative, understanding, you know, what you're doing. And it's really kind of cool how she is being engaged. And that tells me a lot. So on the same day, my, my best girl, Meredith, installs a sculpture in Central Park. What I love about Meredith is that she and I were going to the same foundry for years. I love her work and, and she was loving mine too. So lo and behold, when people started calling her to ask her to do artist talks, she's like, well, if you're having me talk, you have to have Vinnie Bagwell talk because we're both making sculptures of Sojourner Troop at the same time. I thought that was very nice, very generous. And so oftentimes she and I would do this tag team thing. So coincidentally, the sculpture that I installed and the one that she installed were installed and dedicated on the same day. Wow. So this is my cousin Dorinda who does my media. Dorinda's like, we gotta get down there. So as soon as we finished saying goodbye to everybody, we jetted from Highland and got down to New York City because we wanted to see it on day one. So hi, we're here making selfies at the sculpture on day one. So cool. Let's talk about African burial grounds for a second. You know, they're being discovered and recognized all over the place. Do you guys know that there's an African burial ground, a big one in the middle of Van Cortlandt Park? I bet you don't. Point of it is, is that, well, some of you do, but the point of it is, is that they're trying to figure out what to do. They want to do something. The question is, what can we do? And of course, New York City is still shut down for public art, although the mayor did just release the money for victory, only because the oversight committee chair demanded it in December, told the commissioner, tell the mayor, release Ms. Bagel's money. Let's try to remember, New York is the capital of the art world, among other things. At this time, in the middle of Black Lives Matter, New York needs to be vocal. The community wants this public artwork. We need to be doing this public artwork. So stay tuned. They're in the middle of negotiating contracts with the, because the city doesn't contract directly. There's a subcontractor. And when they ever get him straight, then he'll be subcontracting me. I hope to live that long. All right, there's a call to Newburgh. Newburgh disinterred, I don't know, 99 people. I'm not kidding. 99 remains in 2008 and they're warehoused at New Paul's. Are you gonna give them back or what? I'm sorry, shout out to New Paul's, excuse me, and Newburgh. Mm -hmm. Are you gonna reinter the people or not? So there's a woman who's trying to get this moving, mind you, there's a building built where these people were buried. Mm -hmm. So now they need a new place to inter them. The mayor of Newburgh suggested he was willing to put it where the woman would like, but you know, you, you just, mayors don't just get to say, you gotta go through city council, you gotta vote, you gotta have resolution, you gotta have stuff done. Stay tuned on that, just so you know. Meanwhile, in Orange County, off Route 416, near New York State Interstate 84 on the side of the road, see those little stakes? Yeah. You got 86 kids. When I say kids, I mean like youth, high school, aged, under 20, bird on the side of the road. You see how close the road is? It's the road. They called me up. This is the second largest African burial ground in New York State. Now, there's not to say that there aren't burial grounds larger. This is one of the ones that is actually known, registered as a landmark. Mm -hmm. 
1995, they had somebody come and put these PPE, whatever, piping in. So I'm standing there and as a visual artist, my eye is very, very sensitive to patterns. I can't figure out the pattern. I'm like, what is this? So I'm like, you know what? You gotta bring some dignity to these people. You just can't leave it like this. Okay, fine. You know what? Here's what we're gonna do. I want a GPR survey. We got technology now. We don't have to dig people up. We don't have to disturb them. I am not disturbing the dead. I would never do that. Whenever I hear that it's being done, I'm appalled. I tell you what, I'm going to the United States Department of Agriculture. I heard they do it. I'm asking them to do this in-kind service. So I roll up on them and I come straight out the box and I'm direct. And I said, I want you to give us an in-kind service. This is what I want, blah, 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 blah. Next thing I know, the woman's talking ownership. And I said, Olga, you sound like you're willing to do that. You're talking about any money. Are you willing to do this as an in-kind service? She said, I'd be honored. And so the United States Department of Agriculture did a GPR, a ground penetrating radar profile, which gives you a 3D version of where these people are. Now, of course, if you don't know what you're looking at, you don't know what you're looking at. I have no idea what I'm looking at, but here's the really cool thing. My neighbor, Joe Sheldonrein, is the who's who archeologist for the Western hemisphere. That would be this whole side of the planet. Get off the table, Molly. Hmm? Come on, get off the table. So the point of it is, is that I walk down the hall and I knock on the door and I say, Joe, I'm, I'm working on this project. Would you be interested in working on this project? He's like, yes, I would. So this kind of tells you where Montgomery is on the map. It's still the Hudson Valley. And again, they've got a burial ground and they know that it's there. You see the yellow line, that's the road. You see the gray circle, that's a turnaround. Trucks turn around there, that's what they do there. Uh -huh. If they get out their truck and decide to take a pee, they're peeing on the remains on the of graves. It's like, are you serious? We gotta do something. So lo and behold, this is what I'm proposing. We want people to be able to experience the, pee, the place, but we don't want them walking on the burial ground. So we're proposing an eight foot wide pedestrian walkway that goes around the perimeter. And man, this is, this is like hills and valleys. You see that top part there that's kind of blue green? That's a swamp. They used to bury people in the swamp, black people in the swamp. And so we're in the process of developing funding to make this a reality. Meanwhile, Irvington here in Westchester County is recognizing their history of enslaved Africans. This is an interesting story as well. They know where their, their uh, Africans are. Their enslaved Africans are under a building. They're not trying to remove the building. So they're like, we'd like to at least acknowledge them, which is the right thing to do. Mm. So it's like, okay. So they come to me and I'm like, so what do you want to do? And again, they're not trying to do anything really magnanimous, but they're doing something nice and tasteful. So they make a proposal to the, the town trustees and the town trustees tell them no. Let me tell you something. It's funny when white people get mad. The people, evidently they were prepared for no. They inundated the trustee boards with letters of loud protest. It was so noisy that they had to call an emergency meeting to rescind the decision. Hi, Irvington will be celebrating the history of their enslaved Africans. I kind of like that story because again, the trustees, I don't want to call them out. I don't want to say anything not, not nice, but the point of it is, is they didn't care. And the people who live there, it's like, yeah, we're white, but we care. And so they did the right thing. This is the point. So hi, I'm about to be, well, I am a finalist for uh, Harriet Tubman. I hope to be a winner. And that is the most of my presentation. I hope you guys will follow me on Facebook. Uh -huh. uh, try Instagram and Twitter, but really, if you want to know what's going on, I'm, I'm really committed to Facebook because usually I'm too busy to remember Instagram and Twitter. Thank you. Wow, that was incredible, Vinny. Thank you. Super inspiring. And I mean, just how gorgeous everything is. I, I just, it, it makes me want to go out and see everything. In fact, someone wrote in the chat, um, where, when will that be open to officially be viewed? The one along? June 19th, um, June 19th is our target date. Okay. Um, at this point, uh, the County of Westchester and the city of Yonkers have gotten through all of their legal stuff 
and they've got straight green lights. So right now we're waiting for the bid to go out because for a job like that, they have to put it out to bid and uh, a vendor will be selected to do the construction. And um, construction is supposed to begin uh, sometime in May and be, it's, it's like a three week job, so it's not forever. And then we're supposed to be installing the artworks that are in the library uh, at the beginning of June and on June 19th, we're gonna have a party because by then we'll all be past being sequestered with pandemic for the winter. People will have had their shots and folks will be ready to get outside. So we're very excited about it. Like, oh my God, we are almost through 12 years wow. of serious shoulder to the grind. I, you know, at some point I was like, I'm the mother of this project. You could be a godmother. Godmothers swoop in when they feel like it. Mothers work 24 seven, 12 years. Uh -huh. So I, I want to ask, I know people have some questions um, and, and I just, I'm going to ask a, a quick one. I know Allison has a couple and, and then some other people in the group, but your, oh. your breadth of scope of how you see where public art should be moving is, is so impressive. Is there, what is your vision for it? What, what is your wish for it um, in the next tend in the next couple decades because it's an exciting time with the Christopher Columbus being taken down in Newark which I kind of like and that Harriet Tubman's being up we're in a we're in a real precipice right here so if you could just speak about that and then if other people have questions and Allison has a couple well, as well. so let's talk about our last election when you got to see all that red in the country which was a little alarming the people in the red they need educating Okay, they have been fed a lot of misinformation, disinformation, which is two different things. And the, the challenge is how do you inform these people about what is real? Because a lot of them are stuck on stuff that is not real. Like for instance, I get to hear sometimes I accidentally fall down somebody else's rabbit hole and I listen to people talk about Christopher Columbus. And I'm like, so you know he didn't discover America and you know that he did X, Y, and Z, but still you want the sculpture to stay there? Explain to me why. And again, it's false pride. It's a whole lot of stuff that makes zero sense. And it's like, oh, okay, no talking to you. Even if I educate you, no talking to you. It's what my therapist used to call nonsense. You can't make sense out of nonsense. But some people are educable and those are the people that we really wanna target. And so what I'm hoping is that there will be a lot more opportunities for art about black people, people of color. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's art missing about everybody who's not white. And so I think it's also important that black people tell their own stories. So, you know, occasionally you'll see somebody who hires a white artist because they're thinking that's a great artwork, but it's like, yeah, but you know what? White artists get paid all the time. They've been getting paid for centuries. There are a lot of perfectly perfectly good artists who are black or brown or whatever, it's like, you should give them a few extra points when you're you know, screening and deciding who you want to make art for you because of them also being marginalized out of the public art arena. So what I'm hoping is to see more cities, towns, hamlets, you know, particularly here in the Northeast, New York is, you know, we are the leaders of the free world. It's like, seriously, Yorktown, Irvington, Chappaqua, Pound Ridge, you know, all these very, very white sequestered areas. It's like, fine, HUD wants you all to open up for, for you know, federal housing, affordable housing. And of course, Chappaqua and Pound Ridge and all them like, oh, we can't do it. HUD is saying, no, not only can you do it, you will do it. I think the same thing should happen for art in public places. It's like, try to level the playing field. It makes some room. I'm sorry, white people have had a very serious head start. And at this point, for diplomacy's sake, for democracy's sake, for equity's sake, it's like, can you have one sculpture in your town about a black person, a black story? One, just one? Can you start off with one? And of course, as you do the inventory for Westchester County, hi, does Yorktown have a sculpture? Of a black person? I'm just curious. How? Yes, it does. Well, yeah. it does on the Pine Bridge. Okay. What is oh, it? Oh, that's great. One that's great. What is it? Just yeah, one of three. three. I'm, what is it? 
It's there, one of three. It's um, one of three individuals uh, that in have a name for a skirmish of Pine Bridge during the Revolution, okay. and it was an interracial uh, group of uh, of soldiers. And that is, there is that's a, a nice start. So you, you yes. at least not yeah. a hero, okay? Right. Three gold, three gold stars for you. But I'm saying to you, example, the whole state of Connecticut just got their <laughs> first one for the whole state of Connecticut in 2019. This yeah. is my point, okay? Point taken. Because, because we're New Yorkers, because this is Westchester County, which is just above New York <laughs> City, I think that Westchester County should prioritize, reprioritize. And if you're satisfied with what you got, well, then you need to look around and be like, well, who can we help to get one in their community? You know, I'm not saying we're satisfied. <laughs> no, I'm just saying it's, it's about community right. building. You know what I'm yes. saying? This is all under the auspices of community building. And this is why I believe in civic engagement. I, I won the oh, like inaugural uh, George and Darlene Perez Prize from Americans for the Arts last year. 30 grand to do whatever I want with. Thank you very much. Of course, the IRS got paid. But the point of it is, <laughs> is that they gave it to me because most artists do not include civic engagement in their practice. I did it from the very beginning. I thought it was, I thought it was a good idea. I guess that's why I did it. I just thought that people might be interested in this because most people don't know a sculptor. Most people don't know sculptors who make art for public places. Most people don't get to see a sculpture before it gets cast. A lot of times you see it after it's in, you either like it or you don't. It's like, how about if you had a chance to say something before they put it in? And the same thing about when it's coming to your town, don't you want to have some say about what goes up in your town? Mm -hmm. And so it's an opportunity for people to be able to voice their opinion. And I really want to know. I don't want to hear no noise after I put it in. Come to the preview, say something on social media, send me an email. I had somebody call me this morning. This woman was, I'm so happy you have your phone number. I'm like, yeah. People call me all the time. I don't mind talking to people. I want to hear the feedback before I finish. And so I really am an advocate for civic engagement, trying to come up with ideas on how to bring, you know, the community into the process. And when I say the community, I mean the schools, the churches, the community-based organizations, my neighbors, my friends, my family, your neighbors, your friends, your family. I mean, you know, People marvel, it's like, you let people come in your house. I'm like, yeah, I got a purge, but still, you know, and I got security, but still, you have an opportunity to come in and seriously look around, touch, I don't care, touch stuff, just don't take anything. The point of it is, is that I think it's important. This is what gives quality of life. You get to participate in what's happening in your community. You get to say something. I digress. I'm at a party right after I won victory. So I won a million dollars. I hope to someday collect it. The point of it is, is that here comes the elite white people in New York City inviting me to their penthouse parties. And I'm at a party with a bunch of people. I invite Barbara Siegel, who's from Yonkers and she's, she teaches at the School of Visual Arts and she knows more than I do because she's a learned artist. I am not, I don't know what you're talking about. So I'm like, hey, you go with me. And she's like, you want me to go with you to the party? I'm like, yeah, yeah, and sit next to me too because if they ask me something, you can answer. So we're sitting there and somebody to my right says, well, I don't think that the community has the intelligence to make decisions about public art. Oh my God. I keep a straight face. And Barbara looks at me, did you hear what she said? I said, I am not touching that. If you want to heal that, you heal it. Barbara's like, I'm going to say something. Go ahead, Barbara, you heal that. So then we're sitting at the table about an hour later and somebody else says the same thing. So Barbara looks at me, I said, I'll handle this one. So I say to the man, I said, where you live? Chappaqua, Scarsdale, where you live? He says, Scarsdale. I said, in a cul-de-sac? He says, yeah. I said, let me put it in some terms you might understand. So you live in a cul-de-sac and let's say you have a six-year-old, a little girl. And let's say that you make it a point every morning to, before you go to work, you walk her out to the bus. He's like, okay. So one morning you walk her out to the bus and there's a giant phallic symbol in the middle of your cul-de-sac. It's about eight feet tall, erect. How do you feel about that? He looks to the side. I said, don't you want to know who okayed that? Don't you want to know who you can hear up and call? Cause she want to know, daddy, what is that? <laughs> how do you feel? 
feel? He said, okay, you win, you win. I said, no, no, how do you feel? He said, I get it. I said, you got enough intelligence to know that you don't want a giant phallic symbol in your cul-de-sac? He's like, I get it. I said, so don't say that. You sound ignorant when you say that. People know what they like and what they don't like. The reasons don't even matter. Most people look at something, three seconds in, they like it, they don't like it. The reasons don't matter. I don't like it. I don't want it. You want to have an opinion before it shows up in your cul-de-sac. Right. He's like, you're right. I said, that's what I'm talking about. That's all I'm saying. People should have an opportunity to see what's coming to their community. They should have an opportunity to say what they do and do not like about it. They should have a say, I think you should change some things. I'm going through it right now with Norfolk. City of Norfolk. I put up a very nice design. I use their logo, Crescus, which is Latin for we must learn. They're like, nobody cares about Crescus. That is, don't put that up there. Nobody even knows that. that. And I'm like, okay, fine, fine. I'll take it off. I don't care. I tried to make something that's relatable to your town. They're like, nobody knows that. Nobody cares about the Latin motto for Norfolk. I'm like, fine. All I'm saying is, you know, and I don't take offense. I said, fine, let's erase that. What else? You know, and they went on and they gave their opinion. Again, the community did not show up for my first artist talk. So I had to make my presentation twice. When I got there, you see this bulky kind of persona I got? This is me. That's how I talk to people. I said, look, y'all, when I have an artist talk for the community, show up, damn it. Because here's the thing. Your opinion matters to me. I want to hear no noise at the back end because you didn't give me the respect of showing up at my artist talk. They're like, we're sorry. It's like, I take your apology, but I'm telling you, I don't want to do this twice every single time. If I have an announcement, I give you, talk, show up so you can say something. Don't be talking about lady what you don't like. And so again, they voiced their opinion. The project manager is saying to me, you don't have to make any changes if you don't want to. I said, it's not about me. This homework is not for me. Sure. I'm making it for you. It matters what you want and what you don't want. I'm not going to ignore these people. If, if I've got 60 people in a room and they all agree they don't want Kreskis, take Kreskis off. Next question. I, I saw Allison. Do you have a question? I did see Alice asked why Sojourner Truth. Was that a question? No, that's the question, but, but you got to tell her everything else I said. Yeah, this is like a great quote, Alice. Um, I'm just looking for it here. Um, Alice says, and this is a high honor, by the way, Vinny. She says, I want to be your friend. Love your name. Love <laughs> anyone who hears voices. Love that name. Love the name Vinny. That's my mother's sense of humor. Her, that's her two saying my dad who kept telling people he only makes boys. I got a sister named Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Um, Sojourner Truth. So Jonah Truth has a history in New York State. Oh, I know her, her history. I love her. Um, my daughter. Also involved when she with the women's suffrage movement. So again, well, you know, people want to suggest that Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady were the mothers of the suffrage movement. What they don't talk about is how they ostracized Black women. And so Black women were advocating for suffrage for everybody because we're still coming off of slavery. Well, and so is very verbal about that. So, you know. She Again. was manumitted. Um, she was a slave and, and kept running away and eventually ran to Quakers and was manumitted. Right. Um, so there's a whole history. She's got she's got a backstory with New York State, Kingston up in that way, where right. you know they claimed her. Now yep. it's interesting yep. because you know there were some other folks that wanted to claim, you know, uh so Jenna Truth was like, we don't need like five of those in this state. But the point of it is, is that st her story is relative to New York. Oh, absolutely. She definitely has a, a history like Harriet Tubman. By the way, Harriet Tubman's niece calls me up after the party wanting to know why I didn't invite her to the party. I'm like, do I know you? Do I know you? <laughs> so she said, well, we're Facebook friends. I said, but did, when we made friends, did you tell me that you're, I mean, my memory is going, but I would have remembered if you had said that you were Harriet Tubman's relative. You didn't tell me that, did you? She said, well, I don't tell people that. I said, well, I'm not a mind reader. I said, come over, come over. So I invited her, seriously, I cook for people to come over. We had a nice little luncheon, whatever the case may be. She said, but I want to meet Corey. I said, well, I'll have another party and you and Corey can get together. As a matter of fact, I'll give you Corey's number. You can call him up. <laughs> Point of it is, is that these people have families. Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, they got living descendants in freaking Westchester. 
I'm like, where do you live? Yonkers. I said, now stop. Oh my God. That's I said, stop. Funny. Stop. Nobody in Yonkers has ever mentioned that Harriet Tubman's family lives here today. Come on, girl, be real with me. She's like, I know, I just, I don't say anything. I said, no, but here's the thing. People need to see you. You guys are like historical royalty to us. Nobody knows that Sojourner Tooth's family is married into Malcolm X's family. We all just found that out last year. It's like, what? Ooh, boy, what? I didn't know that. What? I didn't know that. Malcolm X was originally Malcolm Little. The Littles live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Michigan. Yeah. They're married into Sojourner Truth's family, the McCleachies. It's like, wow. Wow. That's cool. wow. I had such a kick because he came over, he didn't want to go home. I was like, fine, you can stay at my house. You have to stay at the hotel if you don't mind sleeping on the floor. I got a real nice queen air bed, no problem. So he stayed. He stayed for like three extra days. I had an artist talk at the Hudson River Museum. I got a tremendous kick out of saying, and ladies and gentlemen, I have a special guest for you. Guess who's here? The whole room went nuts. Like, wow. what? Wow. It's like, yes. So Journal Truth has a family member, and here he is. Ask away. Wow. Any more questions? Uh, what yeah, I said on the, on, the, on the chat was that I like anyone who hears, who speaks to the voices and in their head. Love oh, that yeah, part of This is chat. important. When a little girl asked me, hey, 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 hey. Bye, honey. Love you too. See you later. So my nephew visited. Uh -huh. um, little girl asked me, fifth grader, can you get them, please? Thank you. Pardon me. You got chihuahuas. You know, the noise. Little, yeah. girl. little girl asked me, do the voices ever get you in trouble? I'm like, yeah, that's why we're talking about them. Yeah, we got we gotta talk about them. I said, you get in trouble? She says, I get in trouble. I says, you listen to the wrong voice. That's why we have to name them. Okay, you need to know who's talking in your head. Okay. If it's the critic, tell the critic to stop talking. Okay. If it's the blurt, you know, sometimes things come out your mouth before you think about it. You, you need to stop and think before you let the blurt come out your mouth. Seriously, it's oh, important to name good. them. All the ones in my head have a name. <laughs> Seriously, there's the blurred, there's the critic, the skeptic, there's happy girl. I mean, there's a bunch, there's morbid, the one that scares me and tells me I'm going to die and stuff when I get on a plane. It's like, no, no, you stop talking. <laughs> and so they get it. I mean, fifth graders get it when we talk about the voices. No kidding. Well, you'll let us know when that the young, uh, the the garden in Yonkers is June 19th. Right? Yeah, we'll, we'll be putting everything on blast for real. It's very okay. exciting. We want to come to one of your parties. Yes, absolutely. Um, what we're talking about now, I just applied for the David Prize and they asked me, um, if you're not familiar, there's a, there's a prize in New York uh, called the David Prize. It's $200,000. There's a lot of, I can do with that. That's a nice one. And so um, they, they say to you, you have to either live or you have to do work in New York City. So I'm like, victory is going to come to fruition sometime between now and the end of the year, I hope. So mm -hmm. the question is, what are you going to do to make it better for more of us in New York? And I'm like, that's a good question. So I said, why don't you just stay in your lane and do what you do? You know, stay close to what you do. Don't be trying to do something like mm -hmm. outside the lines. So I said to them, I want to continue to do my artist talks, but rather than me talk about, you know, process and things like that, it's like, I really want to talk about other people's ideas for how the arts can mitigate racism. That's what I want to talk about. Ooh because the arts have always been part of racial equity, always, okay? When you look back at the civil rights movement, you had Marlon Brando, you had Harry Belafonte, you had James Baldwin, you had all these arts people. And even now, you know, when, when Angela Bassett and all these people get their awards, they take a moment their platform, because they know everybody's watching, to say something about racial equity. The artists have always been at the lead in shepherding equality. So I want to talk about that more. It's not, I don't need people to tell me I'm a genius. I need people to tell me how can art make a difference? Wow. Talk to me about that. I hope to win. The point of it is, is that I went to Janet and I said, if I don't win, I still want to do it. She's like, me too. Come on, let's do it. So we're going to try to do some in the studio uh, artist talks the way I normally do it, but you know, rather than do them in the winter, because I usually do them like any time of the year, it's like, let's do them you know, in the summer. 
and, and let's do them virtually, kind of like you guys are doing the Zoom, let's do that. And so we're trying to think of all these really interesting and innovative ways to open up discussions about racial democracy, racial equity. How can we begin to fix this? This is going to be a very long process and the arts should have a major role in it. How do we do it? So it's interesting now because you know, we're now all in that because we've been sequestered all winter. We're all now watching these movies. You got movies like Ma Rainey, August Wilson. Every last one of his plays, there's a monologue in there where they talk about what it means to be black and be oppressed. That's the arts informing people about how we really feel unapologetically, just, just laying it out. Like, this is how it makes me feel when I can't do what the Billy Holiday movie. Oh my God, when that movie went off, I cried. I was like, oh my God. I didn't know Billie Holiday. I didn't know that I didn't know Billie Holiday. Story. I didn't know, I, didn't, I just didn't know. I had to seriously, because I talked to the dead people. I had to seriously talk to her for a minute and be like, I'm sorry, I have missed you all this time. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize, I mean, I knew what the song was about. I knew why she sang it, but I didn't know all the other stuff that went with that. I was like, hell, if I went through what she went through, I'd be a heroin addict too. Point of it is, is that being black was not easy yeah. in her time. And this was a woman who tried to do what she could do with the gift that she had been given. This is the point. I feel a certain responsibility as a black person, as an artist, to use the art to help humanity grow and evolve. That's what I'm doing here. I got purpose. She has a great story. Gwendolyn had her hand up for a question. To yes. Ask Gwendolyn. Hi, Vinny. How are you? We're actually friends on Facebook, and I'm so glad Denzel told me about this. Um, there is a burial ground up near Inwood and Dykeman. Where? And it's in the news. Uh, Dykeman, you know, Dykeman Street yes, at 204 Broadway. Uh huh. Now they're talking about this burial are you talking ground. About the one that's by, with the bus stop? There's actually, it's a burial ground. No, I'm saying it's a burial ground partly under a bus stop. Or is that a yes. Place? Well, okay. actually, I think it's I think it's under this um uh it's a car shop or something. I know and then they about. built a parking lot over it. Yes, well, I know it's in about. the news now because okay. uh it was purchased, this plot of land, and they were gonna build a homeless shelter. So now the the people who want to buy it understand the historic part of it. I feel that we as a group uh, should advocate and get some kind of public uh, project happening around it. Is that something that you think that I know you're busy? No, make room. There's always room for it because first of all, these things take a while to develop. Right. For instance, when I did the rain garden project, they asked me, this is 2009, they asked me, how long do you think this is going to take? I was like, 10 possibly 11, 12 years. They're like, what? Yeah. I'm like, listen, 10 years go by in a blink. You'll be 10 years older before you know. And of course now we're just like, wow, that was a quick 10 years. The point of it is, is that when you're starting at the very beginning, it's kind of like when you're having a baby and you miss your period, like I think we killed the rabbit. And then you find out we're pregnant. And then you want to tell somebody and you tell your mother and she's like, well, how many weeks are you? And you say eight and you got 32 more weeks to go. Yeah, right. Some of it is, is that these things take a while. So you're yeah. talking about the very beginning where you know right. you want to do something, but nobody has any money yet. Or maybe you right. got a little money, but you got to leverage the money because kind of like when we start off, it's like $20,000 is not enough to mm-hmm. make a major world-class monument. I mean, you right. can do something with $20,000. You can. Right. But right. again, you're talking about a burial ground. You know, you know, and so it starts off with the vision. You have to have a vision for it. People yes. will buy into it once they know what you're talking about. It's not enough right. to say that we're trying to raise money for the slaves. By the way, the proper word is enslaved Africans. Right. They're not slaves. They're Africans who were enslaved. The right. point of it is, is that, yes, I always want to talk about it. You know, the first question is, what is the vision? So for instance, I'm just going to use Montgomery as a, as a, as a discussion. Mm-hmm. When I went and made my presentation to them, kind of like what I just made to you, they were like, we're gonna give you carte blanche. Whatever you say, that's what we're doing. And, it, and we will be with it as long as it takes for us to do it. So of course, the other week we had the reef laying ceremony. 
and the town supervisors was having a baby on Thursday. You know, they would, had scheduled it or whatever. So getting induced. And I said, let me show you our baby. And so I showed them that what I just showed you. And he looked at it and he said, we have got to find the money to make this happen. I'm like, oh, honey, it's already decided. This is the point. Once you have something to show, I mean, every time I show somebody, they're like, that's beautiful. I haven't even shown the rest of the illustrations. I mean, my architect is now starting to feed me, you know, the, the elevation, like that's the overview. I mean, they're just jaw dropping. I love these people because they make my vision real that other people can see it. That's what you have to do. You have to come up with a vision and then you have to have a conceptual design so that when you go to somebody and you ask them for the money and they say, what's the money for? You can show them and say, this is what we're, this is what we're doing. And again, you want something that is jaw dropping. Like, oh my God, I love that. How much do you need? You know, and they give what they can give, but you always want that kind of love circulating. You want people to be passionate about your bandwagon and you want them to get on your bandwagon. That's right. And again, it's 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 wonderful. Like for instance, last year the media got on my bandwagon. Channel mm -hmm. two, four, seven had me on TV twice. And when I got off, they were just like, let us know how we can help you. We just love this. You know, Tony, Tony Ayello is my best buddy now. He wrote letters to the mayor demanding to know what is going on with Vinny and Victory. I'm just saying you want that kind of enthusiasm. You want right. people to care. They need to care. Otherwise, it becomes an extracurricular activity and nobody wants to do the work because their lives are so eclipsing the rest of their world. You know, somebody has to be the mother to that project, father yeah. to that project. Then you need godparents. The best godparents are the political people. You need your senator, your city mm -hmm. council person, your assembly person. You need all those people lined up caring about it and making sure that if they have a resource in their Rolodex, they can say, call this person, go see that person. I spoke to this person for you. I did that. And you create this energy and this momentum because you got to do it for a couple of years. These mm -hmm. things don't happen very quickly. And I think it's a good time. And then I'm going to get off. I'm sorry, guys. I think it's a good time right now. Because we, um, and and yeah. there are a lot of folks now that now have these new clauses in their uh, guidelines that say we are giving particular attention to women and people of color. The money is there. Right, right, right. Vinny, AJ, and, but, and, oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I just oh noticed. no, I'll, I'll just put it in the chat because I'm in an exhibit at the Dykeman Farmhouse and it's about enslavement. And that's why I'm saying this is a good time now. We got so hey, much press. I'll give you my number. You can call me. We'll get together. Please put it in the chat because I think if we all got together and say, hey, this is what has happened on New York One. It's here. Let's, let's, let's get this area. Let's get somebody like Vinnie Bagwell, you know, and some other local artists and do something. I think it's a great time. Thank Absolutely. you. Because this is the thing, you know, and again, a lot of times when I, 914 843 a lot of times when I am, make sure it's the right number, people be like, that's the wrong number. Um, a lot of times when I am competing, you know, I like to ask my commissioners, so do you enjoy sleeping at night? When they say, Ms. Bagwell, you know, do you have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Do you like sleeping at night? And they laugh and no, no, for real, do you like sleeping at night? Because if you give this to me, I will handle this for you. I've been doing this so long, I know what to do. You don't want to give $100,000, $300,000, $500,000, a million dollars to somebody who doesn't know what they're doing and never done it before. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't. I, they might be the most amazing artists in the world, but if they don't understand the business of public art, the business of fundraising, the business that goes along with the whole shaboodle, you're handicapped. That means you gotta know. And oftentimes the people who are commissioning don't know. So, so, so how are you gonna get things done if you're dealing with the blind leading the blind? Anybody else? Um, AJ Woodson from Black Westchester said, we are celebrating you in the Women's Month issue coming up out next week. Oh, nice. We'd love to have you on our radio show. Please hit me up. And then they gave the um, 
I, I gave you my number, call me. Cause honestly, my memory is dim. By tomorrow, I'm not gonna remember any of this. Seriously, <laughs> get the number out the chat or Google. My number is everywhere. You can call me. Allison, did you wanna take a question or read some of them that are there in the chat? So many great things. Um, Vinny, folks talking about how you're a, a hero, a national hero, and, and so many really interesting questions coming through. Yeah. One that I just kind of came across was like when you're making artwork, um, how cathartic is your work and spiritual? You become really intimate with the, the figures that you're um, working on and they do take some time. So is there a catharsis or a spiritual connection that you can talk about? That part makes it all worthwhile. So I'm here to tell you the hard part is dealing with the people. I'm not talking about the community. I'm talking about the people who commission these things. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes you're dealing with people who are not artists. Mm -hmm. um, they don't understand process. Um, like example, when I was working with the state of New York, I had to call my project manager's manager and say to him, I can't be vexed when I'm making artwork. Anger is like static on a radio. People who disturb my peace, they're creating static on my radio. I can't hear God. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, because it, it's not, I'm not just an artist, I'm a business person. I'm running a business, okay? And, and mind you, where some people do one commission a year, I'm doing four and five a year every year. I'm tired, my body hurts, I'm 63, I'm serious. And so the point of it is, is that my patience isn't what it used to be. I mean, my daughter will tell you, my mom's really nice and she's so patient, but my patience is running thin now because I'm tired, for real. I mean, if you're over 50, you know what I mean, you're tired, you're just not as flexible and as easy as you used to be. Yeah. And so I do, Business during the day, I work in the middle of the night because in the middle of the night, I don't have to check my emails because everybody's sleeping. Nobody's calling me. Um, I put on mindless TV. I like to put movies on that I've seen before. I've seen The Matrix about 500 times, okay? I don't have to watch it. I can just listen. I know it's gonna go on. I have to leave and look up. And so there's a certain amount of relaxation because when you go into the flow and I mean everybody has some version of the flow when you're doing something that you love it could be anything if you love cleaning your house your cleaning your house can be cathartic folding towels can be cathartic gardening is cathartic you know when you get into the flow it's like your mind relaxes and stuff just kind of happens this is what artists live for being in the flow the challenge is learning how to be in the flow at will. And ideally, we want to be in the flow all the time. But unfortunately, you got to deal with people in business. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you, people get on your nerves. You got to sit there and argue about contracts and, and terms. I mean, last year, I argued for eight months with the city of Norfolk about the death clause. What happens if I die? Eight months, we're going back and forth. No. My parents who are 88 years old and my daughter who's 31 will not be paying you to finish your artwork. No, I, you know, I just won't be doing it. If that's how you feel about it. You're being unreasonable. Who does that? Nobody does that. I can show you the last 20 contracts. Nobody does that. Point of it is, is that you're wanting to work, but your job gets delayed for eight months because you're arguing about stupidity. I'm sorry, Mal, I think it's the truth. The point of it is, is that this goes on all the time. There's always something going on that has everything to do with your getting to the artwork, but you got to deal with business first. Absolutely. I, <laughs> it's the people, but I love that you can work at night. And I think um, many artists choose the late hours to complete their artwork. One, one last thing I had a question about, um, and I wanna just commend you for working in a, a traditionally male medium and also the size of your work. Um, I teach art and I always think about how young women work in a small scale and they, they might not work with traditionally male materials like you do, so I think that's awesome. I just had a question for you that, that came up in my mind, which is, how would you define the difference between a work of art or sculpture and a monument? A sort of monument really kind of commemorates, but is there, is there an overlap 
and yeah, I don't know, this just came to mind to me, sculpture versus monument. There, there are some people who don't like the word monument. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I never use it. Um, example, when I was raising money for the rain garden, there are a lot of people who don't give money for monuments. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why not? So I don't use the word monument. I, I just simply call them public place, public art for public places or public artworks. Um, and if it happens to be about someone, I'm just storytelling. I don't call it a monument. You know, um, I guess you could qualify it like that. You know, I'm making a monument to the slaves. It was like, no, I'm just telling you a story about the enslaved Africans who lived here in Westchester. And coincidentally, their story is of national significance. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I never use the word monument, mostly again, because I kept coming across these walls where they say we don't give money for monuments. And I'm like, you know, they have their definition of monument, but I'm like, but that's, that's, that's jargon. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's like, it's, it's like, I can just change the words and it could be the same thing. What difference does it make? Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's a matter of perspective, um, which is why, you know, I don't consider myself a monument maker. I consider myself a storyteller. I'll stand here and tell you stories all day long. You see how, how fast the time's going by. It's like, I could do this all night long because I got lots of stories. You know, and again, you know, these are interesting stories. S slavery is an epic story. You can tell stories for like 100 years, 400 years, because there's so many things that happen to different people in different places. There's a common thread that kind of runs through it. But still, you know, this is what I simply call storytelling. I don't know if that answers for you, but that's how I feel about yeah, it. I think that's a great, and you're, you're telling the stories of, of people whose stories need to be told. And I think that's the most important, whether we- History is the memory of people. This is the thing. And, you know, in this particular instance, you have a group of people that have pretty much hogged the storytelling and they've kind of eclipsed everybody else. Like yeah. those stories don't matter, but those stories are part of the same history. And so it's kind of like, you know, when you are telling a story, but you leave out certain parts, you tell the story out of context. And then, then when you put it back into context, what you said has a whole nother meaning now. This is, this is the point is that, you know, it's like people saying that Christopher Columbus discovered America. It's like, no, he didn't. He did not. He made all kinds of monuments to this man. And, and what he did was not really applaudable. I mean, be honest, it's not. But it's how they slanted the story. Mm -hmm. when you put it in context of the truth understand history is supposed to be about the truth if you talk to historians historians and there are a lot of white people interested in history they're interested in the truth mm -hmm. anything else any other questions Elise Graham wrote I love the bias relief elements what a clever and beautiful way to integrate multiple stories in one sculpture it's an old style, you know, like for instance, um, a lot of people don't do bar relief. I mean, most sculptors don't, they just don't, I don't know why, they just don't use it. Um, when I realized I could do it, like, you know, it was hard. The first time I was like, oh, wait a minute, this is math. You know, you got to figure out background, middle ground, foreground. You got to look at a photograph and try to figure out like what are the different levels. And, and, and you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, when you're doing something complicated. But the point of it is, is that I liked doing it because number one, it's kind of always a little hard to do, um, but you get more of a story out of it. You know, it, it speaks more thoroughly than just, you know, a Kodak moment for a three-dimensional sculpture. And so because there are a lot of vast surfaces like Sojourner Truth, I was excited about her because she had a giant skirt. I'm like, oh, I can just ride all around the skirt and make it walk all around it. You know, and again, it gives you an opportunity to say more. I think for most people, that's intriguing. Like they don't expect anything to be on the back. And so of course, when I designed it, even the state was like, oh, we need to build a walkway around the back because people are gonna be trying to climb on the rock, trying to see the back. We should just make, let's, let's redesign this. So in the middle of it, they invested more money and created a different kind of walkway so that people could walk around it so they could see the back easily because they love the back. They're like, the back is, look at the, do you see the back? Look at the back. I'm like, I know, this is the way you want people to feel. It's like, it's supposed to pull you 
and make you look. And so that's when I decide that, you know what, I'm just gonna do this all the time. And so, you know, it's become somewhat of a signature now. I mean, I do straight bar relief, but I really like coming up with different facets of the story to put on the surfaces, again, to make people look and to wonder and to pull out their phone and Google and, you know, talk to each other. And, you know, it creates opportunities for dialogue. That's important. I'm just looking in the chat. Um, is there anybody else that has a question they want to just ask directly if we're something we're missing in the chat? Yeah, um, I would love to write another, uh, another, I don't know if it's a question. I'm hoping, when will you find out if you will get the money that will allow you to do, use your art and storytelling in a way where we can really begin to have uh, discussions about race? Um, first of all, I've got, I've got, hold on. I've got a public artwork that I'm doing for Norfolk. Mm -hmm. Mind you, I'm creating all this here in Yonkers. I've got a public artwork that I'm doing for Norfolk. I've got a public artwork that I'm doing for Boise, Idaho. These are all about black people. Really? Okay, I'm doing one for Boise, Idaho. Mind you, Norfolk and Boise, Idaho picked me in fall of 2020. So these artworks technically are a little late. And again, you know, pandemic slowed a lot of things down. But sure. the point of it is, is that you know, we're getting through conceptual design. It was interesting because I won both of them without a concept. And so we had to do conceptual design first. So this has taken a little bit of a while, but the point is that I'll be doing those two. And then, as I said, I imagine that I'll start victory sometime between now and the end of the year. So I'll be doing three public artworks sometime this year. I'd like to believe I could win Harriet Tubman. That'll be number four. The point is, is that I'll be doing public art in the studio for a while, like at least a year, if not more. And then I'm continuing to look for new stuff. So my goal is not to stop. I'm not one of those people that's gonna retire. I'll just be like a hundred still making art. The point is, is that when I actually have the big ones in house, this is a good time to talk because people seriously wanna watch that. They're just like, oh my God, there's a life. There's two of them, look, there's two of them in the studio at the same time, you know, and so, Again, it's an opportunity for people to see something that they normally don't see. So that's a reason for them to tune in. And up until now, I normally don't do video in studio. Like for instance, as I said, my, my cousin Dorinda is now doing my media and she's putting together the uh, virtual uh, unveiling for the three that are coming to the library. And she's like, where's all the video of you working on the rain gun? I said, no, I don't do video. She said, why not? I said, because I'm not really trying to show myself sculpting. Are you kidding me? I'm like, nope, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't make videos while I'm sculpting. I make videos with the sculptures in the background and I talk. That's what I do. I don't really need a witness watching me do what I do. First of all, I'm not trying to arm the people that compete against me. Let's start with that. Oh, okay. So the point of it is, is that you occasionally, like for instance, there is a video if you go on youtube there's one video where i'm working on sojourner truth it's like oh what is she doing but it's so brief you don't know the point of it is is that it's not important i don't teach art i'm not an art teacher nor am i interested in being an art teacher what i want to talk about is conception what i want to talk about is what does the artwork mean why does it matter what is the story yeah. What is the moral of that story? What are you learning from that story? Why is that story even important enough to put in the public realm? I want to talk about meaning. And so when the artworks are in the house, it's a good time to tell those people's stories. Like for instance, Richard A. Tucker was a black man who was born into an affluent family. His father was a minister. In the old days, being a minister was one of the most important things you could be if you were black, okay? Because these were the pillars of the community. So his father was a minister. He grew up, at, this is in the, in the mid 1850s, he was born 1850. So this is before slavery ended. So he was born before slavery ended. He went to college, okay? Point of it is he went to college when slavery was just abolished. This man became one of the first black teachers in Norfolk. 
Wow. Ultimately, they named a school after him after he had been teaching for 47 years. Wow. It was a time when learning how to read was illegal. People who were trying to teach black people to read could go to jail. They could be killed. Black people could be jailed, killed for learning how to read. People take literacy for granted. Black people have had to go through so much. That's something to talk about because people forget that aspect of our, of our history. Black people forget that sometimes. That for Frederick Douglass example, when he moved to Massachusetts, it was a big deal for him to be able to sit on a public bench and read the newspaper in public. You know, I'm just simply saying, these are things to talk about. I mean, I could tell stories all day long based on the public artworks that I'm doing. For Boise, they're naming, they're doing a, 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 a public art project about Irma Heyman. If you Google her, nothing comes up. Who in the world is Irma Heyman? But if you go to Boise, people in Boise know who she is. Same yeah. thing with Doc Hurley up in Hartford, Connecticut. Hartford, Connecticut is a predominantly black city. Mm -hmm. Walter Doc Hurley grew up being a athlete star, football, basketball, he goes to Virginia State, becomes, again, a lettered athlete, star, okay? Goes into the army, comes back home, wants to teach, is able to teach, but they won't let him coach an athletic team because he's black. He decides he's gonna do it anyway. He's gonna do it at the boys club. So now he's dealing with kids from the community and he's willing that a lot of these kids are disadvantaged. So he decides he's gonna raise money to send them to school. At the end of his tenure, this man has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to send more than 500 kids to school. If you go to Hartford today and mention his name, I guarantee you somebody got a Doc Curley story. That's a good story. That's an everyday man who just decides to do something for his community and he affects a couple of hundred kids' lives. These are good stories. These are good stories. These are the kinds of stories that come out of oppression. So I could talk like this all day long while making art. I don't have to talk about myself. I talk about other people's stories because that's what I'm doing. I'm telling other people's stories, but all these stories are instrumental about how to be a good human being. Absolutely. How to be a good, community member, how to have quality life in your community, how to be more than about yourself. Yeah. Vinny, I think we could listen to you all night. I'm absolute, I, I, I love hearing all of these stories, but um, we're getting close to um, wrapping up, but are there, are there any other people who have questions? Because I know there was um, a couple more in the chat that maybe we didn't get to. Anybody? I just have a question, if you don't mind. Hi. Um, you talked about, one, one of the things you, you mentioned was that you not necessarily want to be teaching. You want to, you know, you have another, you, you have another avenue to, to pursue, but how fulfilling would it be? Do you do you have the, the thought of use, having kids apprentice for you or or learn from you in terms of, so that they can continue on with your work? Okay, so here's the thing. I have kids, like for instance, I have two interns right now. I have one who is a, a remote intern who's going to Syracuse. She wants to be a curator. I'm talking to her about business and being self-employed because I'm saying to her, oh, you want to be a curator? So maybe you might want to work for a museum, but the way things are going now for museums and things like that, it's, it, life is changing dramatically for all of us because of pandemic and pandemic is not going to be over next year. So the question now is, how do you create a job for yourself if the museums aren't open? How do you come up with other kinds of civic engagement ideas? Because now we're used to technology. We've learned how to do Zoom and things. Everybody's doing this. How do you come up with other ideas? And where's your money coming from? What happens if they give you a chunk of change, but it's not enough to do what you want to do? Do you know how to write a grant? So I'm showing her how not to lay down like, oh, please, sir, this is all we have. Can we have some more? It's like, no, learn how to work for yourself. Learn how to create your own reality. You can create your own reality. Watch The Secret 2006 on Netflix. Ask, believe, receive. There's a, there's a method to this joint. There are ways to get things done at the Earth School. The question is, do you know how? If you have a gift, you're highly favored already. 
Absolutely. You're already favorite. The question is, what is the purpose of your gift? What are you supposed to do with that? It's not random. It's never random. And so those are the kinds of things I talk to. Even the little kids, we talk about, I go around the room. Okay, I don't care what your name is. What do you love? 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 Do you love? And right. sometimes they're like, I don't know. No, you love something. Come on. What's your passion? You know, what's your, what do you, what do you, what do you just, and I use the word love because sometimes I don't know the word passion. I'm like, no, if you had the weekend off and your mother's leaving you alone and you, you don't get to do whatever you want, what's the thing you want to do the most? Like when I was seven, I just want to play with my dolls. Okay. Sometimes I get bored with my dolls. I go get my drawing pad. My father just kept me in drawing pans and pencil sharpeners and pencils, okay? And at some point, my mother gave me the good putty eraser. Oh my God, that was miraculous. Like, now you have to worry about the red marks, okay? The point of it is, is that my parents left me alone a lot. Not to say they weren't attentive, but they let me play by myself. Mm -hmm. I think part of the challenge with some of today's youth are too programmed. Let them get bored. Let them find stuff to do that they like to do by themselves. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's reading a book. Sometimes it's make up your own little stories. Sometimes kids want to know how to bake. I mean, they want to do all kinds of stuff. Let them do some stuff. And again, this is how they find out what they love. So we go around the room. Most of the kids, 95% of the kids in the room, come about fifth graders. 95% of them are already artists. They like to sing, they like to write songs, they like to do poetry, they like to do pottery. You know, they like to bake cookies. They like, I mean, they like to make things. And it's like, okay, so if you like to make cupcakes, but your parents are attorneys and they want you to go to law school, you could go to law school, but maybe you're not gonna like law school. Maybe you would rather make cupcakes. You know what's gonna happen? When you get to be about 40, you'd be like, bump the law. You know, I'm gonna take all this money. I'm gonna buy me a store. I'm gonna open up a cupcake shop on Central Avenue. Seriously, that's how things happen. A lot of people find themselves in the middle years. They have the middle life crises. They realize they hate their jobs. They don't want to do this. Then they find stuff that they love. And next thing you know, they're opening up a nursery or they're doing something else that they love. I'm saying to little kids, you could just do that from the start. If you could figure out what you love the most and focus on that and study that and try to find people who do that, get yourself a mentor. Talk to old people. You know, old people just like you. I'm just like you. I remember 10, I remember 11. I've just been here longer than you. You see how I talk? Seriously, I remember 10 and 11. Don't be afraid to talk to old people. Old people are cool. We got cool stories to tell. You know, talk to somebody besides your parents. I'm just saying, when you talk to kids like that, it's like, okay, like you're cool. It's like, no, there's a whole lot of cool old people. You should talk to them. When I lived in Maryland, I lived in Columbia, which is a planned city, briefly. If you Google Columbia, Maryland, and you put the word Columbia, Maryland, civility, there's a whole curriculum that comes up about civility. They teach civility. They've been teaching civility. I don't know why Mr. Biden doesn't make that be a national thing. They teach civility in Columbia, Maryland, K through 12. We got there in third grade. Third grade was about learning how to talk to old people. So they make the third graders go to the nursing home once a month to read to the old people. The old people love it because they're so cute. And the kids realize that the old people got stories too. And so they teach, learn how to get along with old people. When you're a kindergartner, you learn about littering. You don't throw stuff on the ground, pick that up. You see the, here, let's take, they take the little kids around, make the kids pick up the trash. Every year they've got something that they teach kids about how to be a civilized community member. Mm -hmm. Learn how to get along. They teach tolerance. That's something else. Everybody's not going to look like you. You don't have to have all your friends look like you. It's okay if somebody's not like you. Learn how to tolerate people who have red hair. Learn how to tolerate people who have brown skin. Learn how to tolerate people who can't walk. Learn how to talk. They teach that. It's a you know what? I've, I've always had a problem with the word tolerance, though. I, I think it, it I, I, only in that it should be respect, not tolerance. To tolerate well, means to. I agree. It's there's something wrong with it, and and we and, and you have to. You're hold absolutely off. right. I don't disagree. All I'm saying is that the city of Columbia, Maryland, which is a planned city, they're trying. Okay, they made it part of the curriculum. The library 
is the repository for the curriculum. I'm telling mm -hmm. you, if you go online and Google Columbia, Maryland, civility, the whole thing comes up. It's right. like, why aren't we teaching this in the schools? The parents are too busy working. People don't have time to teach their kids not to hit each other at home anymore. They just let the kids do what they do and then they put the teachers to fix it. You know, but I remember, a time, I remember a time when you were taught all those things at home. Mm -hmm. I know, but nobody teaches that, not like they used to. Mm -hmm. they used to. The point of it is, is that now you got all this craziness on the TV. You'd be wondering, how did that happen? It's like, cause nobody's yeah. teaching how to get along. You don't yeah. hit your brother. Yeah. Don't yeah. tell your brother you're sorry. You know, it's <laughs> parents are at home. They're busy working. All right. Vinny, one last question before we close, and it's an important one because Yorktown actually has a very rich history. Um, uh, Revolutionary War, a lot, lot of stuff went on here, and we're just beginning to uncover more and more about the African American history. Um, how, how can we bring public art? And we have Alice Broker as a, a councilwoman, and and we would love to find a way, what are some of the next steps we could do? I know that's a big question, but that we could bring more public art to the town. I think you should start with your, uh, I think you should start with, again, civic engagement. You should perhaps create a committee of people who are interested in history in Yorktown. Um, you should make sure that you've got a historian on that committee, mm -hmm. you have educators on that committee, you should definitely have politicians and again, people from different facets of the community should be on that committee and you should assign people to try to Google or wherever you think the history is and bring it to the table and let's look at some of these stories. Mm -hmm. And then the question is what story resonates the most? This is the story we wanna tell first. You can't tell all the stories. Right. Sometimes you got stories that are all related. And it's like, wait, this is one big story, okay. So we can tell these six things as one public artwork. Like for instance, originally we start off wanting to tell about enslaved Africans who lived in the attic of Phillips Manor Hall. I was like, well, why does anybody care about that? And seriously, because you have to ask yourself these questions. Why is anybody gonna care about that? So I'm trying to find out the history. And then I find out that John Jay wrote the first law to free these people. And that six of the people who lived there we're among the first to be men and that's an important part of the story that's fascinating you know and so we just kept trying to find different pieces same thing with uh montgomery we're trying to figure out how these 86 kids get buried here what are they doing up here where did he buy these people from did he buy them did he bring them here did he go get them what happened so we're starting to learn different things like the palatines you got germans who were brought over by the dutch as indentured slaves yeah. And indentured servants, and when they freed them, they gave them a black servant to take, and they moved up county. It's like I never heard that story. That's really is that how that happened? And so you begin to learn different things, and ultimately you have consensus. You talk about it with each other. What story do we think is the most important story for us to tell first? Boom. Once you decide what the story is. Then you bring in an artist, somebody like me, and you say, we need somebody to interpret this story. The first question I wanna know is where are you gonna put it? That's a talk show too. It's like, where's the most important place to put this? Well, in Yonkers, because we got four miles of waterfront property and the city of Yonkers has decided they wanna revitalize the city by putting 4,000 new residential homes on the waterfront, it's like, well, this should be on the waterfront because that's where the people are gonna be. Oh yeah, by the way, the train station is near there. So it'll be easy for people to get there. So again, you have to kind of look at your town and see how people who don't live there experience your town because you're creating art for public places. People are gonna show up. You wanna make it easy for them. So you wanna put it someplace that's easy to find. You wanna put it someplace where there's parking. You wanna, if, if in Yorktown, last I heard, y'all don't have a heavy duty metro uh, no, bus right. system up there. So the question is for people who don't drive, how do they get there? Is there a train station? It's like, okay, well, you know, you have to figure out how are we going to make this accessible? Public art is about accessibility. Mm -hmm. Again, outdoors is ideal because people can see it any time of the day. Somebody be busy for Christmas time, hanging out at your house at the party and be on their way home and like, whoa, whoa, stop the car, look at that. Let's go look at that real fast. You know, mm -hmm. and next thing you know, it's like, they got a monument to the enslaved Africans in New York town. Look at this, look at this, honey, read this. Wait, wait, it's not that little thing we can read when we get home because we're cold, let's go. 
I'm just saying, you make it so that people can find the information. They can Google. You put virtual tours online. People don't even have to come. They just go online and everything's on the line. People don't want to come out in pandemic, but they still want to know. So again, you start using technology. Start trying to think of ideas how to make the information accessible. And again, you talk about it to anybody who will listen because different people have different resources. Next thing you know, somebody says, well, you know, my brother-in-law is the head of American Express. You know, they give money. You know, and so you never know who knows somebody. Right. You know, and so this is why you talk about everything that you're doing all the time because there are people they call the future. There are people in the future who are supposed to be part of your soul group to help you get done what you came here to do. Amen. That's how this works. Amen. Everything is not now. I mean, although now is real, the future is going to be now sooner or later. Absolutely. So this is why you start planting seeds in different places because some of those seeds are going to grow and spout and they're going to bear fruit in the future. And if you live long enough, you're like, oh my God, we finished, we got it done. Beautiful. That's how it works. Thank you, Vinny. Yes, we've got lots of stories to tell in Yorktown. And I think the fact that you describe yourself as a storyteller really resonates for us. Um, and this will be a conversation that we'll be having in the Arts Council for sure. Invite me up anytime. I'm, I'm always, you know, ready to be a cheerleader or something like, come on, you all, let's do this for real. Because, yeah, you know, you. it always has to be, seriously, there always has to be the, the, the I call it the fantastic four. Usually there's like three or four people who will shepherd something through. Mm -hmm. Out of those three or four, there's one person who doesn't sleep. And you have to have that every single time. Yeah. You have to have that. Because if anybody sleeps, if everybody sleeps at once, nothing gets done. Right. Somebody got to be up with the baby in the middle of the night. Seriously. <laughs> This That's is the true. point. That's true. And so the question is, who are those people? And if you find people who are flaking, let them flake. Find new people. At the beginning of the Rain Garden Project, I did not want to do, I did not want to do community meetings. I did not. I said, people will just flake. They waste your time. They don't want to do that. My mentor said, Vinny, do it anyway. Let them flake. I was like, okay. So when people flake, I was like, fine, because I'm not flaking. And so, of course, later, much later, when it got quiet, people would say to me, so are you still doing that rain garden project? Like, yes, I am. As a matter of fact, I just won $100,000. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, five years, 10 years. So is it still happening? Yes, it is. And I swear, I cannot wait for June to say, there, okay? These yeah. things take a while. They do. Well, we're coming to the, the rain garden opening. We're going to yeah, be we there. We're coming. June will be there, masked or whatever, yes. no mask, whatever, whatever is required. Okay. We'll be yeah. there. We'll be there. Well, that's exciting. So by all means, call me when you're ready to talk some more. And you know, I'll be happy to share what I know. You know, we're gonna go on Facebook. We'll, it. well, I'm gonna friend you on Facebook. Please do. Okay. I'll be Tremendous. Tremendous. Inbox, though, so I can I remember who you are, because honestly, after a while I'm like, I'll remind you. Yes. Wonderful to have you tonight. We can't thank you enough, Yorktown for Justice. Thank you, Wendy. Honored. Wendy. It's Wendy. Where is Wendy? Wendy. She's Wendy's hiding behind the Wendy sign. She's <laughs> probably multitasking, guys. I'm sure Wendy, she's doing a couple. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> thank you so much, Vinny. This is great. Time. We really appreciate it here. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Vinny. We'll talk again in the future, you guys will tell me what's real. We'll have you up again. All right, I'll thank be back. You, in Jenny. person. In person. Good all night. Right. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I'll be looking for you all. We thank will you. be. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. June 1st. Good night, everyone. Hi. Thanks so much. This is wonderful. Thank you. Yes. So on the June 19th, I just want to be clear. On June 19th, it's going to be the unveiling at the site. Okay. Of the African Rain Garden in yeah, Yonkers. We will, will be Apex. We will be there. Which is a, which is a, um, a residential uh, apartment building. If you can find the Apex, we will be there. We already. Okay. We already great. Each other. So see you then. Beautiful. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So long. Good night, Benny. This was great. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Here you are, Wendy. There I am. Thank, Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> we could have an entourage. We could bike from Yorktown to Yonkers for this event. Yeah. The bike path goes right there. People are like, can we talk about a bus? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the beeline bus that's really, we need a bus <laughs> for, for the older people with the bad knees you know we need a bus <laughs> well that is actually the beeline is always a big mystery to me but if, if we could get the beeline maybe a shuttle that we could do that ask believe receive that's, that's right mr latimer i'm Okay. Mr. Latimer is who's making it happen. You know, this County of Westchester is funding construction. So don't discount Mr. Latimer, ask him a question. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah, he is, I love him. He's fabulous. All right, everyone, thank you for coming. Thank you. Any your work is so thank beautiful. You so thank, thank you. you for giving, thank you for bringing it to the world. It's really yeah, Absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. I will be in Ms. touch. Bagwell. I'll look for you. Ms. Bagwell, my godfather, Leroy Clark from Trinidad and Tobago. You may not know him. He's an artist uh -huh. and he is very fond of your work. Oh, tell him I said hi then. Thank you. All right. There you go. Oh, bit of all right, I'm going to shut the Zoom down now. I'm going to con convert this to a YouTube link and I'm going to email it to you guys. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Thank Great. you guys. Thank you so much, Vinny. Okay. So long. Great night. Thank you. Stay well. So long. Thank you.